Um, we're going to be in the book of Isaiah this evening, and <clears throat> I'll never forget being in seminary and having a professor in the Bible exposition class, and um, he opened the book of Revelation. And on the first day of studying that book, he sort of looked up from the lectern nervously, and he said, um, well, I wish that you could take this class with uh, anyone else here on the faculty, because... Uh, well, I think you'd be better served. Um, and he kind of chuckled and said, well, I'm serious. And then he continued on. And, um, you know, uh, from my perspective, he did a wonderful job of teaching the book of Revelation, but I understand what he means. And there are books you're just less comfortable with. And as I endeavor to orient you to the book of Isaiah tonight, I need to reflect something of the attitude of my professor years ago in seminary, um, his attitude toward Revelation, because um, I've never preached through Isaiah. I've not studied Isaiah in an in-depth way of any kind since seminary, and um, have just preached portions of it and read it. And so on the one hand, I wish that anyone else could orient you to the text of Isaiah this evening. Um, I should have had Greg teach or uh, Brent or uh, someone, but on the other hand, um, I can speak to you as a Christian. I can speak to you as a, as a man. I can speak to you as a lifelong reader of the scriptures. And I can speak to you as one who has um, sort of beheld the wonder of Isaiah, the glory of God on display in Isaiah. I can speak to you as one who has been comforted many times by the truth in Isaiah and as one who has stood in awe of the sovereignty and power and majesty of God on display in Isaiah. And so I may not be able to explain it to you nearly as well as many other people. In fact, what I would suggest to you is um, at some point, if you want to dig a little deeper into Isaiah, would be to listen to a sermon that Mark Dever did years ago. It's about a 52-minute uh, sermon, but it is an overview of Isaiah. And... Um, Having listened to just the first half of that, um, Mark Dever does a, a masterful job of pulling together, especially um, the historical context of the book of Isaiah, looking at what was happening on the world scene at that time and the various political machinations and all that was unfolding. And so if you want to dig a little deeper, I commend uh, Mark Dever. So you can just Google Mark Dever, Isaiah overview, it'll pop right up on Capitol Hill Baptist Church website. There's also um, his overview sermons are in print form. Uh, they're published as a two-volume series. The Old Testament is called Promises Made and the New Testament Promises Kept. Is that right, Brent? And I uh, highly recommend that two-volume uh, book series to you as well. Um, but for tonight, my hope is to simply introduce you and orient your heart to the text of Isaiah and to whet your appetite to go and read through it on your own. So that's what we're going to do and we will read some portions of Isaiah tonight together, although only very select portions. It is a very long book at 66 chapters. We'll start with the title itself. Isaiah, this is the name of the prophet Isaiah and it is the traditional title of the book that he has written. Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation. And so the title of the book also serves as a really good summary of the theme of the book. And so that one's uh, pretty easy. Isaiah, Yahweh is salvation. It's a pretty good way to remember what the book is all about. Now in terms of who wrote it and when, uh, if you read broadly, you're going to see that out in the broader world, um, I've written here some scholars, the truth is, <clears throat> among secular scholars, they nearly all claim that Isaiah was written by at least two authors, one composing chapters 1 through 39, another composing um, chapters uh, 40 through 66, and their, their primary reason, in truth, although they put forward other reasons, their primary reason is that they would say Isaiah could not have written about Babylon's invasion of Judah 150 years before it happens. You see, later in the book of Isaiah, we have some detailed prophecies 
um, <clears throat> including a man's name, um, 150 years before this invasion by the Babylonian Empire happened. So the truth is, scholars that reject um, the miraculous and reject the possibility of future prophecy automatically reject anything that seems to speak of the future. Well, if one can accept the possibility of future prophecy, which, by the way, is a necessary component of the inspiration of Scripture by a sovereign God who exists outside of time, well, then there's absolutely no reason to reject Isaiah as the sole author of the book. Furthermore, the New Testament quotes both halves, so to speak, of Isaiah many times, attributing both halves, all three major sections of the book, to Isaiah the man. So, if there's multiple authors for the book of Isaiah, one of whom is not Isaiah, then the New Testament is lying. So these questions become pretty simple at a certain point. If we can accept a God who does miracles, if we can accept a book that is breathed out by him, then we should have no problem accepting future prophecy in a book revealed by God to his prophets. And if we can accept that, then we have absolutely no trouble accepting Isaiah as the author of the book that bears his name. Now, Isaiah's long ministry stretches from about 740 B.C. to roughly 680 B.C. He ministered during the reigns of Uzziah, uh, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, the dates are there, in fact, chapter 37 mentions the death of the Assyrian king Sennacherib, who we know died in 681 B.C. So we have a very long ministry of Isaiah. He is likely um, <clears throat> living in Jerusalem. We know from some notes along the way in the book that he was married, that he has a few children. Um, uh, he seems to have moved about in uh, well-to-do, perhaps royal circles but we don't know a whole lot about him. Um, but we do have um, his book. And frankly, the book of Isaiah stands as, uh, boy, something of a Mount Everest in the Old Testament. Um, the prophecies within Isaiah are soaring, soaring prophecies. Um, we have here some of the, the highest peaks in all of the Old Testament as well as uh, in the prophets and in some ways in all of Scripture. Uh, more on that as we go. I'll give you just a bare outline here because I think this is you know, maybe what will be helpful to you. Um, uh, just to think about the book, chapters 1 through 35 are mostly prophecies of judgment for sin. Now you'll notice in your print of the Bible, whichever one you have there, you'll probably see that it's laid out as poetry. The vast majority of this section is laid out in <clears throat> Hebrew poetry. These are beautiful poetic oracles, largely of judgment in the first half of the book. If you turn in your Bible to chapter 36, you'll notice that it changes a bit, and we get more narrative. Because in chapters 36 to 39, we shift gears into something of, of a historical transition. We shift into a bit of a historical transition that looks a bit more like kings or chronicles laying out this story concerning Hezekiah. Hezekiah and his sin and his salvation, extension of his life. But finally, you come to chapter 40. And in chapters 40 to 66, you have prophecies of salvation from sin. Um, if we can lump the whole uh, book together, if we can put chapters 36 to 39 together with chapters 1 to 35, then you have this first major portion of the book is largely focused on judgment, uh, 1 to 39. And then 40 to 66 we have uh, this portion that is largely focused on salvation, on redemption. There's certainly shining promises in the first portion, and there's also still some pronouncements of woe and judgment in the last portion, but generally speaking, we move from oracles of judgment to promises of salvation in the latter portion of the book. Uh, it's not to be made much of at all, but uh, because our chapter... <laughs> Verse divisions, of course, are uh, man-made. 
but um, many are keen to point out that we have 66 books in the Bible, and we also have 66 chapters now, the way we handle the text in Isaiah. And it's also interesting that we have 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. And the book of Isaiah sort of divides along those lines, um, with the first 39 chapters being a little more about these pronouncements of judgment, and the, the latter 27 um, chapters being a little more about uh, deliverance through God's chosen servant. So people have been quick to notice that that looks a little bit like our Old Testament and New Testament. Um, if that helps you remember something about the book, great. But we do not put any stock in that in any way. Our chapter divisions are uh, added much, much, much later. They're purely man-made. Um, but it is an interesting note that people like to make sometimes. Um, and so people point out it reads a little bit like a, a, you know, the Bible in miniature. <laughs> Here is sin and judgment and then promise of salvation through God's chosen servant. And then we have Isaiah 52, 13 to Isaiah 53, 12, which is, which is the most detailed look at the Christ. It reads like the New Testament. And so there in the middle of it, we have this soaring, incredible truth about Jesus. So you can kind of think of the book of Isaiah almost like a little miniature version of the Bible itself. Now, what about key themes? If you were to sit and, and make it a goal to read through Isaiah over the next week or so. What should you be looking for? What is Isaiah doing as he writes? Well, <clears throat> just for very broad context, um, this is not a good time, the second half of the 8th century B.C. Israel is largely turning away from God. And what we have is that Assyria has arisen as the first truly uh, worldwide uh, kind of superpower and Assyria is marching westward and taking over more and more small nations to the west. And they get closer and closer to Israel. Kings in Israel quite unwisely begin reaching out to them and, and, and trusting them to police the nation. Well, of course this turns against them. And so eventually, um, by 722 uh, B.C., what we have is that the northern kingdom of Israel falls to Assyria. They just come in, they march through. It's thought that the army uh, of Assyria at the time may have had 200,000 troops that were marching through the land at that time. They just could march through and do whatever they wanted. So it's a tumultuous time, and Assyria is asserting dominance over the world scene, and um, Israel ultimately falls victim to Assyria. Um, Judah, the southern kingdom, certainly is not free from strife with Assyria, but it will be later when the Babylonian Empire has come to power that the southern kingdom will finally fall as well. This is prophesied in the book of Isaiah. But Isaiah is writing here, like I say, between 740 and 680 and talking about these events. Um, at some point in here, the nation, especially the northern kingdom, is deported, captured. Many of them marched off, tortured. The Assyrians were known for their terrible um, uh, brutality and torture. And so Isaiah is writing to a people that are suffering, they're struggling, some are deported, they're wondering what happened to these promises that God has made. He's also writing to those still in the land, in essence pleading with them to change their ways, to understand um, that there's still time, there's still hope. Although by the time the book is completed and just a little while later, 150 years in the future, what you have is now all of Israel, northern and southern kingdoms, having been subjugated and deported, but they still have the book of Isaiah to read. And so they can understand what has happened to them by reading Isaiah's prophecy. Much more importantly, they can understand who God is why God has done this, because God has done it, not the Assyrians, and what God intends to do about it next. You see, that's what Isaiah is doing for the people of Israel, especially as they are deported and living in exile and wondering how on earth there's still a bright future for God's people when God has allowed them to be completely defeated. So, on my, uh, your notes there, 
God promised Abraham that his descendants would multiply and bless the entire world. We talked about that in Genesis. God promises David, of course, in 2 Samuel 7, that one of his descendants would sit on his throne forever and, and bless the world. Well, Israel and the line of kings in Judah have largely abandoned God. This was true in Isaiah's day, and it continued to be true thereafter as Israel um, contained and read Isaiah. So what on earth does this mean for the promises of God to his people and to the world beyond? This is the question rattling in the minds on a daily basis of those uh, Jews who were deported and still even thinking about Yahweh. Many did. Many were. Some assimilated, drifted so far. I'm not sure they were overly concerned. But there was always a remnant asking God, where are you and what is the plan? And for those with a heart and a mind to wonder and to reach out to God and hold on to his word, Isaiah was the brightest light they had. Because Isaiah comes along and explains that this is God's doing for his glory, for their good, and for their ultimate eternal salvation into which people from all over the world will be folded. This is what Isaiah ends up explaining. Um, Ray Ortland writes it this way. He says it very well. Isaiah's answer to all these questions is that although God must purify his people through judgment, he has an overruling purpose of grace, beginning with Isaiah himself in chapter 6, spreading to Judah, read about that in chapters 7 and 9, and Israel, chapters 9 to 11, and resulting in endless joy. Chapter 12, 1 to 6. He says, even the nations of the world are taken into account. 13 to 27, those chapters talk about many of the other nations. He continues, the purpose of Isaiah then is to declare the good news that God will glorify himself through the renewed and increased glory of his people, which will attract the nations. The book of Isaiah is a vision of hope for sinners through the coming Messiah, promising uh, for the ransomed people of God a new world where sin and sorrow will be forever forgotten. Isaiah 35.10 and 51.11 he references. That's Ray Ortland writing the introduction to Isaiah in the uh, ESV study Bible. So, one of the themes of Isaiah is that the people of God, when times got tough, placed their hopes in all the wrong people and things instead of in Yahweh and his power himself. Now, before we go on and read some key verses and even a chapter or two here together, I see a parallel, and I can't help but pause and try to draw us into the story that Isaiah is telling. Because Isaiah's is an eternal story. Isaiah's story is a story for the ages because it looks forward to the first coming of Jesus and later to the second coming of God's chosen servant. And what will happen uh, in the kingdom on a new heaven and a new earth, Isaiah spans time. So it's actually our story as well. And there are some powerful parallel here for us in North America in 2024. If you haven't noticed, our nation is changing rapidly. My question for you for brief discussion. Where have you seen people, maybe even God's people, maybe even your own heart, Tempting to put their hopes other than in God. As we, or Christians today, as God's people today, consider our ever-changing nation, a nation that I believe is under God's judgment. I don't think you can read Genesis, I mean, Romans 1 and escape that conclusion. Well, that puts us in a very similar place. As the judgment of God for sin comes upon us and we feel its effects, then like Israel, we need to put our hope in something. 
Now, the book of Isaiah is written to teach us where to put our hope, but we are just like the Israelites in that we are just as quick to hope in the wrong things. Now, what are some of the things that you find Christians hoping in, or maybe your own heart is tempted to hope in, other than God, as you consider these interesting times? Greg? Okay. You can see a long history as far as putting our hope in the political system. Yeah. Way back to the 70s and the majority. Yeah. Which led to Ronald Reagan getting elected, which, uh-huh. you know, I, <laughs> I, but Good. I, I think Reagan's a great president, but I mean, but the hope in Reagan mm-hmm. that, okay, everything's going to really turn around now. And yes. And then, okay, well, when Reagan wasn't in it, and mm-hmm. then the W. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then there's the hope. And then, Good. You know, with Clinton, you know, I can remember evangelicals talking about how horrible Clinton was because of his womanizing mm-hmm. and things like that. Yet those same, not the same, but you, but you, you mm-hmm. did not hear that that argument when Trump was running for president, mm-hmm. who was just as much mm-hmm. a right. womanizer right. as Clinton was, but yet he would be welcome to people's pulpits. And, you know, very good. Yeah. Good. Mm-hmm. Very good. It, it's not going to be. I mean, I mean, our hope is yeah. the return of Christ. Amen. Uh, so, but I mean, I've just seen that over my lifetime. Yes. And of course, in ministry in that today, you know, making sure that folks understand that our hope is not going to be good. Left. Very good. Yeah, Christians ought to to care about these things, they ought to go out and vote, they ought to read their Bible and then go out and vote. And yet, if we place our hope in the political system or in any one politician, we're going to be let down fast. And that's, uh, Israel was doing that. That's why they're reaching out to Assyria at first and saying, hey, we see that you're powerful. Hey, we worship Yahweh, you see, but uh, we could use your help over here. You, know, you could help police our borders and, and patrol, you know. Uh, It didn't go so well for them. Yeah, where else are we as Christians tempted to put our hope other than God? Where else? You had one? Same one. Same one. Anyone else? Yeah, Larry. Yeah. Mm. Very good. Good. Yeah. That's very good, Larry, because look, God has given us a mind to think and reason, and he's given us the ability to do things. We're made in his image. We can problem solve. We can work hard and get stuff done. And so then we're always tempted to hope in ourselves, to hope in our own ability, to hope in the gifts that God has given us or the resources God has given us. And all of a sudden, we're, we're busily halfway down some road, and we have not stopped to trust in the Lord. We've not asked him repeatedly to guide us, to keep us from error, to show us what to do. We're not digging into his word to look for specific principles. We're not seeking wisdom from other godly individuals. And we realize, quite often, later, we realize, you know what, I, I think I did that one on my own. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's tricky, isn't it? Yeah, very good. We can hope in politics, that'll let us down. We can hope in ourself, and we'll let ourselves down. What else? Are there any other common areas that you've seen people hope in? Brent? I mean, this might be more for younger generations, maybe not, but the technology mm. is something we trust in. Good. Hope in technology. There's an app for that. <laughs> yeah, that's what you're saying. There's a big problem. Don't worry. There's got to be an app for that. Yeah. yeah, surely there's some easy solution. Right? Maybe it's a theological problem. Well, don't worry, I have YouTube. I will, let the, I will let the geniuses of YouTube guide me into light and clarity. Instead of saying, I will get in my Bible with my church family and my elders, and together we will move forward, hopefully. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, what else? Oh, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Sometimes, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's sort of a, a subset of ourselves, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. That's good. Thinking that we will come up with some formula or some balance that will unlock the secret to getting everything done in the right way. Yeah, instead of crying out to God and saying, Lord, I can't get anything done. Help. <laughs> yeah, very good. So I say that just so that we can begin thinking. I think you have to bring those misplaced hopes that we all are tempted toward or struggle with um, and bring them to the book of Isaiah as you read. That's a good way to pray as you start reading Isaiah is, Lord, I am just as likely to place my hope in things and people other than you as any Israelite ever was. And so, Lord, I need you to rearrange my priorities and root my hope where you say to root them. You see, that's the way to read Isaiah. Now you're reading the book looking for an answer to that question, God, what would you have me to hope in? As I consider you, as I consider my self and my sin, as I consider my nation and what seems to be the judgment of your hand, Father, what must I hope in for life now and eternal? Now, if you read the book of Isaiah asking that question, you will have a fruitful read. Um, we need to be careful bringing questions to the text, of course. I don't want you to miss um, other themes that are happening, but that may get you going in the book of Isaiah looking for where are the misplaced hopes of the people and how does God redirect their hopes, um, rooting them in him and in his servant. So with that, let's go back to our notes. and I want to show you some key verses and some key themes. Um, <clears throat> first, you need to mark in your Bible Isaiah 48, 9 to 11. Isaiah 48, 9 to 11. What we see here is the theme of God's glory. Um, God will glorify himself. All that he's doing in judging Israel, all that he's doing in purifying Israel, all that he's doing in sending a savior to save those among Israel and the rest of the world who will turn from their sin, all that God is doing, he is doing for his own glory. God will glorify Israel himself. Chapter 48, verses 9 to 11, for my name's sake, says God, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. That is strong meat, friends. And you should have those verses circled, highlighted, and uh, have an asterisk beside it in your Bible. And return to it. This is why God acts. Um, is in order to glorify himself. There is nothing better for us as his people than that he should be glorified in all things. God will glorify himself, but how will he do this? As we read the book of Isaiah, as we let it unfold in all of its 66 chapters of glory, and it is glorious, we realize that God will glorify himself by sending his son or his servant now look with me at Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to a this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. 
don't lose track as you read Isaiah and you read historical names and the names of nations and the specific sins of the people in these nations. Don't lose sight of what's happening. God will glorify himself by sending his son. He's going to act in judgment against sin. He must. He has to because his justice demands it. His glory demands it. But into this mess of judgment, he will send his son for salvation. Well, this is incredible. This is the gospel in the Old Testament. Um, Many writers, ancient and modern, have said that Isaiah is the fifth gospel. (laughs) They say jokingly because it is so clear in pointing to Christ. So God will glorify himself, 48, 9 to 11, by sending his son, 9, 6, and 7. Why? To intercede for transgressors. Look at 53, 6 with me. 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. My friends, th- this is the key to Isaiah. Do you want to understand what's happening? God will glorify himself. He will do that strongly, powerfully, and with perfect justice in judgment on all sinners, on all who reject him. There will be judgment. God will glorify himself by sending his son as well into this mess. A son who will also be one with the father. And he will do this in order to intercede for transgressors. Because not a single Israelite was worse off than us in their accounting before God. (laughs) We have gone astray as sheep just as much as they ever had. We, as meaning you and I as individuals in the room, we, meaning modern Americans, we, meaning the entire human race, has drifted from God just as Israel did and are in desperate need of an, inter, uh, of, a, of an intercessor. This is the book of Isaiah. Now, <clears throat> um, Isaiah 53, we say for shorthand, it's really 52.13, and then the rest of 53, but Isaiah 53 stands as the clearest, most detailed prophecy of the cross of Christ in the Old Testament, and it is the center and high point of Isaiah 40 to 66. You can really see Isaiah 53 and the three verses that precede it. Isaiah 53 is the high point. If if Isaiah is something like the Mount Everest of the prophets and maybe of the whole Old Testament, (laughs) then the snow-capped peak is 52.13 to 53.12. Because it's there that we understand what erring sheep need. Um, I've told you this before, but um, I remember being in the kitchen with my grandfather as a young boy and looking up out his kitchen window and seeing these white things moving way up in his back field and saying, Grandpa, what is that? And I did not understand what I was seeing. And he peered up out the window and kind of smiled. And he said, up, I know what to do. And he walked over to the phone, rotary dial in the kitchen in those days, of course, the long cord, you know. The upgrade was when you got the long cord instead of the short one. The one that would then get all tangled, and now it was shorter than the short one, so it didn't matter. But he walked over to the rotary dial phone, and he called Betty. Because... um, Betty was one of the other, you know, one of the matriarchs of the hill, and her family had been there for a few generations. And, and uh, he said, Betty, the sheep are out. I see him up there. He said, I got my grandson here. We'll, we'll go up and get him back in for you. And she said, oh, oh, you know, thank you. And so I went with my grandfather, and we went up in the field, 
and I helped him corral all of the sheep back across his field and back. We found where the fence was down and got him through and spent some time fixing the fence. And this is just something that happens in the country. It's what people do for each other. And if you're around sheep long enough, you have done this yourself because sheep wander. They're not that smart, friends. Now, I love animals, and I love sheep. We had two of them kind of as pets, you know. My mom loved animals, and she had these two sheep, and a different couple of them, you know, Moses and Miriam were two of them. <laughs> and they're wonderful, beautiful creatures, but they're fearful, they're skittish, and quite frankly, they're stupid. Now, I don't, I don't want to be mean. If there's any sheep listening, I'm sorry. But they just, that's right, that's the side. Um, but they are. They're fearful, they're skittish, they're a little bit stupid, and they wander constantly. If the fence gets down, they just will run. And then when you're trying to help them, they're afraid of you, and they, they don't want your help, and they run away from you, and you have to use that to your advantage as you corral them. It is a scene. It is not easy to get sheep back where they belong. That's the story of the Bible. That's the story of Isaiah, is that all we like sheep have gone astray. And, and no one could get us back where we belonged. And, and, and God sent prophets and priests and kings, and, and nobody could do it. And so he had to come down into the field himself. He sent his son his only son, into the field because the only one that could do it is the one that could pay the, for the sins of these sheep and lead them back into the fold. <laughs> now, this, is, this is something of what the Bible is. This is something of Isaiah. And so what we get in this latter portion of Isaiah 40 to 66 are four servant songs, four glorious songs that point to the Son of God, the chosen uh, servant of God that God is sending into the world to save the sheep, to intercede for the sheep, to pay for their sins, and to lead them home to the Father. This is what Isaiah is about. When you read it, don't get frustrated. It's long. Don't, don't get discouraged when you're reading names of nations and people that, that you kind of remember hearing, but you're not exactly sure um, keep going. Read it prayerfully and read it as the story of God who will judge sin but will also reflect his truest, deepest heart by sending his son down into this sinful world to intercede for those very sheep that are running from him and bring him home. But let me show you this. Go to chapter 42, Isaiah 42. And I want to look at this first servant song. I'm just going to read these to you. There's not time to make much comment. But Isaiah 42, 1 through 7. By the way, Isaiah chapter 40 to 48, if I recall, has about 215 verses. 216 verses, something like that. And it's over 100 of them that directly mention the greatness or the glory of God. It's over half of the verses in Isaiah 40 to 48 that specifically mention, you can test me later tonight, the greatness or the glory or the majesty of our God. It's why when you're not sure where to turn, when you need to strengthen your own soul or comfort the soul of someone else, you can open up Isaiah 40 to 48, plop a finger, and you're going to do pretty well. You don't have to get outside of Isaiah 41 and 42, and you can counsel your own soul and the souls of many others in many situations. Because this passage of Scripture fixes a telescope on the glory and the majesty of God. We can just look and see Him there in all of His glory. Um, and so... Let me read to you some of these servant songs in and just beyond that portion. 42, 1 to 7, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. 
That when God is speaking of his chosen servant upon whom he has put his spirit, he is speaking about who? About Jesus. He is speaking about the what? What's a good Old Testament term here? The suffering servant. He's speaking of the Messiah. This is his anointed one. It is Jesus Christ, his son. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. What is happening in all this judgment? Why is our nation turning away? Why is the news like it is today? Because God is bringing about justice to glorify himself and vindicate his name and fulfill his promises. And he will do it through his chosen servant. Now look at verse 2. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. This is referring to his first advent. We just saw this in Matthew recently. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Bringing out the theme again from 48. Uh, 9 to 11 there at the end. This is um, a servant song. You might call this the servant's ministry. It's foreshadowing the servant's ministry. Turn now to chapter 49, verses 1 to 6. And if we'd call that first song the servant's ministry, we might call this one the servant's mission. 49, verses 1 to 6. Listen to me, O coastlands, And give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. And in the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord. And my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. These are lofty songs. There is much happening. I think they have meaning in a near context, but I think that they also point directly to Christ. They are a flashing arrow pointing forward to and landing ultimately in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Um, Isaiah is quoted. I forgot to write the number down. Many times through the New Testament, of course, and especially in the Gospels, um, we have these very prophecies brought out by the Gospel writers with the specific formula, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. It was not lost on the writers of the New Testament that Isaiah was speaking about Jesus. 
and they relied heavily upon the writing of Isaiah to point to Jesus and his ministry and his identity as the Messiah. Turn a page to the right in your Bible, Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9. We might call this the servant's Gethsemane. This is because we can see Jesus here as he is near to the cross, I believe, and considering what must be done and wrestling with it and yet setting his face to the cross. Father, not my will, but yours be done. 50, verse 4, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I believe this is referring to Jesus and his humanity. Jesus in his human nature, learning. Uh, Luke 2.52 says that he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I believe he is reflecting on the process of his father waking him up day by day as Jesus studied the text of Scripture. I believe that he developed in his humanity his own sense of himself as the Messiah and the Son of God, not first and foremost, by divine revelation. I believe that Jesus developed that in his humanity by studying the Old Testament scriptures. And by the help of the Holy Spirit, as he did so, um, in a heart and mind never tainted by sin, I believe that Jesus grew into his full understanding of his identity of the Son of God and Messiah. I do not believe he was walking around as a three-year-old restricting his verbal fluency and theological knowledge playing a game with all the poor adults that weren't ready to handle him yet. No. I believe that in very real humanity, Jesus lived and grew and came into an understanding by the Spirit's help of just exactly who he was. Um... The Lord God has opened my ear. I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. He came to understand fully, clearly, precisely who he was as the Son of God, as the Messiah, and marched willingly then toward the cross. Jesus no doubt had memorized Isaiah 52 and 53, Psalm 22, etc. Almost certainly these high points of the Old Testament he would have had memorized as many, many, many Jews did in his day. He knew exactly what he was facing. And in that garden, he sweat great drops of blood as a result because his human nature was just as real as your human nature and my human nature. And he dreaded that, um, that suffering as we did, not the physical suffering, I believe, so much as the knowledge that for the first time ever in his life, his perfect, intimate fellowship with the Father would be taken away as he shouldered the sins of erring sheep like you and me in order to pay for them so that justice could be done. That's why he wrestled in that garden. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. All those who are accusing the Son of God um, will wear out like a garment, but he and his mission will stand forever. Now, turn to Isaiah 52, verse 13. I don't need to comment much on this. I just want to read it to you because it is so clear it doesn't need much comment. 
But here we have this final servant song that you might call the servant's atonement. From the servant's ministry to the servant's mission to the servant's Gethsemane to the servant's atonement. Listen to this and you'll understand why so many have called this um, the fifth gospel. (laughs) Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations, meaning making them clean, holy. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation... Who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet, listen, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. There is our only hope. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Brothers and sisters, God didn't just send his son down into this field of sin to lead us back to the Father. He sent his son down into the field of sin to become a sheep. The only one who never wandered. 
a sheep who would become the Passover lamb, who would let his throat be slit, his lifeblood poured out instead of ours. So that as one of the sheep, he could stand in our place, tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin, and die the death that we deserve. So that in his resurrection, by that power, the same spirit that raised him from the dead working in us, we could be saved, we could be sanctified, we could be taken back to the Father. And friends, that is our hope. No politician can forgive your sins. No strength of your own will cleanse your life. Um, uh, no, no perfect schedule. <laughs> uh, no self-help technique. None of these things will make sense of God's judgment or will bring about God's justice will forgive your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, or lead you to things. So what is our hope? The same as Israel's under the Assyrian and then Babylonian tyranny. It is the glory of God worked out in the lives of sinners through his Son. It's God's sovereign grace poured out for his glory. Now, in that, we can hope. No matter how bad the judgment gets, uh, no matter how far we wander or have wandered, if we come and place our faith in God and his provision of his Son as our substitute, if we will repent and believe and follow him, and we will have placed our hope in the one and only source that can lead us all the way home. Isaiah is written to comfort your heart with that message. Read it. Cling to it. Don't get distracted or discouraged if there's history that's unfamiliar to you. Just get a good study Bible. We'll recommend one. And it'll explain all those names you can't pronounce as you go. Look for the name you can pronounce the servant's name. God the Father Almighty and Jesus Christ His Son. You know their names. You can place your hope there and be led all the way home. So uh, go read Isaiah and look for these themes. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank You and we love You. We are those sheep and we are the ones who have placed our hopes in a hundred failing ailing lesser things. Oh, Father, by your Spirit, for, for the sake of your name and your glory alone, <laughs> would you fix our hope ever more firmly in your Son, the ultimate, true, pure revelation of who you are. Oh, Father, we thank you for Jesus. Pray that you would keep us from discouragement or despair as we watch the news. In fact, Father, quite the opposite. Would you fill us with joy at the reality that our hope 